So this is a picture um, taken at what is called the Scopes trial. What was happening during this trial is a teacher in Tennessee, I believe, had been teaching evolution to students. The problem with that is at the time, teaching evolution in school was illegal. There was a law on the books saying you could not teach this theory in public schools. So they took uh, advantage of this uh, trial of this teacher. Eventually he was convicted because he was teaching evolution and it was against the law. But um, some famous lawyers actually um, came together to really debate evolution uh, and is called the monkey trials. Um, William Jennings Bryan was one of them and I can't remember who was the other um, lawyer. But uh, this is the first time where evolution itself kind of stood the trial of the society. So not necessarily um, as a scientific theory, but as its acceptance um, in being taught, you know, in a, in a place that was had some objections to it. But this wasn't the first time evolution had been on trial, so to speak. There were some criticisms within the scientific community as well. So let's backtrack and talk about well, where did evolution, where did this theory come from? So it was first published in an essay by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. Alfred Wallace was um, uh, similar to Darwin, um, an explorer who went, uh, a naturalist who went out and was making observations about the um, animals and life which he saw, usually in new um, places of the world such as Southeast Asia. Um, but they published this, um, which was based on this idea that descent with modification. So living things are modified as they reproduce. Um, we now uh, define evolution as a change in a trait or changes in traits in a population over time. So one from one generation to the next. Now, Darwin Although they both published this together, Darwin had been collecting a lot of information over a long period of time, and it was kind of his ultimate work, his book that he, he was going to publish. But he, he wanted to continually refine it because he knew it was a new idea. He wanted to make sure there was a lot of evidence to support it. So he didn't really want to um, publish it when he did, but he felt pressured to because um, other people were also coming up with similar ideas. So he gathered a lot of information from a lot of different sources and, and compiled it into this theory. Um, the first, or one of the um, influences which first really helped him form this theory was a voyage he took around the world as a naturalist on a ship called uh, the Beagle. So Voyage of the Beagle. They also went to the Galapagos Islands. One of the things he noticed on there was that there were lots of species of finches that all looked like a finch from the mainland, but they were also all slightly different depending on what island they were on and what sort of food resource they had taken um, and had specialized in. And so Darwin saw this and thought, well, you know, there must have been a common ancestor from the mainland that came here and then diverged into all these different species. Um, he also made other observations. Uh, he did some work with barnacles and made some observations with whales and baleen and other things. Um, and he had, you know, a lot of time to think while you're sitting on a ship going around the world. And so he started to put some of this information together. Darwin was also influenced by, you know, non-biologist scientists, including an economist Miss named Malthus, who wrote an essay called An Essay of the Principle of Population. What Malthus noticed was that human populations seem to be growing at an exponential rate, but it seemed like at some point you're going to run out of resources if you're going to continue that growth. Um, and he called this the point of crisis. What Darwin kind of took from this was, well, there are a lot of children that are born. Not all of them survive. So what accounts for some surviving and others not? And his conclusion was there must be some sort of selection process occurring um, that allows those some of them to live and some of them to not. And he, he saw application of this in the um, 
the living things throughout the world, not just in humans. He also was uh, influenced by a publication by Lyell, who was a geologist who studied this kind of groundbreaking work called Principles of Geology. It was based on this idea of gradualism, which was that the strata or layers in the earth actually took a very long time and changed from one to the other in a very gradual um, time period. Um, and this allowed then, and, and you found fossils in these different layers which were the same even in different parts of the world. Different, um, different layers had the same type of organisms. Sorry, different areas of the world with the same layers had the same type of organisms within them. Um, and so Darwin thought, well, um, if it's a, a more gradual change, maybe there is uh, time enough then in the world's history to allow for evolution to occur. He also was involved in artificial selection. So he was a pigeon breeder. And you can take a pigeon. Now, pretty much all pigeons look pretty similar um, if they're from the same species. But you can take and select four different traits and create different breeds or different kinds of pigeons. Lots of different variation, but yet their parents all look the same. Uh, similarly, you can find the same thing in agriculture with, um, for example, wild mustard was cultivated into multiple different types of vegetables which we eat today. Kohlrabi, broccoli, cauliflower as well, cabbage. Um, and these are because different traits were selected um, and cultivated for different types of food. Well, if humans can select for specific traits and that can create variation in a population, um, the idea is, well, maybe these environmental pressures are doing the same thing. So um, Darwin eventually published his book in 1859. Um, there were other theories of evolution including um, Lamarck but his hypothesis is not was not fully supported was not the same uh, as the natural selection um, eventually Darwin did publish his book again in 1859 on the origin of species by means of natural selection and it, again it's based on this evolution by descent with modification kind of the synonymous term but again like I said it this this was a groundbreaking work, but it was met with skepticism by many scientists because of a few different reason, reasons. First, there was no method of inheritance. So traits are passed from one generation to another, but we, we don't know how. Um, second, the fossil record wasn't very complete. So you had a lot of fossils, but they didn't really seem to relate to each other. So it didn't really show um, evolution occurring over time. And kind of with that, the age of the Earth was thought to be thousands of years old, not enough time for evolution to account for the many different species of the world. But since publication, there's been a lot of evidence which has added to this theory. So first off, genetics was discovered with the work of Mendel around the beginning of the 1900s. Um, then uh, later, the structure of DNA, um, and the ability to sequence genes um, has allowed us to really see and be able to manipulate then genes and this is then the way that or um, traits are passed from one one generation to another so a mode of inheritance had been found in genes all right second the fossil record has started to show as more and more fossils are found these intermediate species or missing links and now you can uh, much more clearly see the evolution of a primitive species to a modern species just by looking at the the fossil record. So some examples of that include horse evolution where you have a primitive hierarchotherium, small, has multiple digits, um, but you can then see where the reduction of these digits and the increase in size in the, size in the fossil record has led to our modern day horse um, similarly, you can find uh, changes in whale evolution and human evolution. <clears throat> there has also been, like we said, the DNA 
um, which shows genes. You can also find similarities and differences in relationships based on RNA and proteins, so molecules which are used to maintain life. Um, will show similarities and differences and you can attribute those to ancestry, right? So one of the principal um, ideas in evolution is that um, all life has a common ancestor and you can group relationships based on how recently they had a common ancestor. You can also look at anatomy of living things and find similarities and differences um, and attribute those to a common ancestor as well. So for example, you can have analogous traits, which we'll talk more about in a, in a, in a second, where they have the same function but are from different structures. So this is called convergent evolution. Or homologous structures, which is what we have here, where you have the same structure but it's used for a different function. This is called divergent evolution. And this also denotes that there is a common ancestor. So in all of these mammals, you have the same bones. You have the same um, arm, forearm, wrist, and hand bones, but they are used for different things. Again, denoting that selection by the natural environment was selecting for different traits on the same anatomy. You can also find um, these uh, traits when you're comparing um, uh, the development of, of different species. So ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny was a phrase coined by Ernst Haeckel, which really shows a common ancestry by looking at similar structures in the development of different species so or different groups. So in vertebrates, when you look at a developing embryo, they all look the same. They all have the same traits. Those traits, however, then go on to develop very different structures. So by looking at how and when these things develop, you can also determine relationships in evolution and ancestry. Also, the age of the Earth. So um, as we learn more and more about geology, we can determine that the Earth is actually billions of years old, not thousands of years old, and that allows for enough time for evolution to take place. All right, and then going back to these analogous traits. So biogeography is then looking at um, life as shaped by the climate in which it lives. So here, the climate then can uh, predict not only the environment, but also what is the natural forces which are selecting for traits. So if you look at similar species, such as foxes, Okay, if they're in a similar environment, such as a desert in Africa or a desert in North America, they have similar traits. Okay, um, they'll have these large ears for radiating heat, um, long limbs to keep um, their bodies away from the hot ground, and you can see, you know, these are very similar. But uh, an analogous traits, then, if you can find a related um, species such as these foxes in different environments such as this one up in this arctic area it's going to have different traits because it was selected for a different environment so it has short ears it has short limbs it has a rotund body um, and it's all white to match the snow so so again this is showing evidence of uh, natural selection even in related species um, with a common ancestor all right, finally, the last evidence we're going to talk about are vestigial structures. These do not have a function, but are characteristics which still remain in different species. So some examples include whale pelvic bones. Whales have a pelvis and even a leg bone, but this is just embedded in the blubber. It doesn't actually do anything. Humans have a lot of vestigial traits, including ear wiggling muscles. That doesn't really help you with anything, but maybe an ancestor needed to point their ears in certain directions to, you know, check for predators. Uh, tailbone, um, we don't have any tails, no reason to have that bone there. An appendix, um, appendix can even have negative effects. So this vestigial um, structure may have been used for um, digestion. 
but now it could just get and get infected and and kill you if you don't get it removed okay so those are all the evidences of evolution which have added and supported the theory and give the theory of evolution its credence as a very sound theory in science we also have some examples of evolution so one of the criticisms is that well you can't see evolution occurring well that's not so we do have some examples um, one of these examples includes soapberry bugs which feed on fruits um, these are found in Florida and their beaks are best when or they can feed um, most efficiently when their beaks are at a specific size so they can get at their fruit right um, they originally had uh, they didn't have this introduced species of let's say this is um, an orange I can't remember the type of fruit that they eat on but um, they have an introduced species of fruit which has a different shape than the native species of fruit and what's happened is um, those fruits um, that the soapberry bug eat are at a different distance away depending on the type of, of, of fruit so in a population on this introduced fruit uh, the beaks are actually much smaller because the shape is different whereas the native fruits have a larger beak so this has produced changes in traits in different populations over time over generations um, and eventually may lead to new species that no longer um, feed on the same things or or interact or mate with each other another example a, a microbial example of evolution includes MRSA so MRSA is methicillin resistance staphylococcus aurelius okay um, sorry arius and they originally would could be treated with um, you know this type of bacteria could be treated with antibiotics but they have since developed a resistance to antibiotics um, probably through just one or a few individuals that had some mutation that no longer um, allowed them to be affected by the antibiotic. Um, this then led to a change in the population. So now you have these strains of bacteria which we cannot kill with our medicines. And this, has, this can become a problem because this is also known as flesh-eating bacteria. This can um, slowly eat your skin and flesh away and eventually kill you if you don't find a treatment that can kill it. Okay, so there are some very real um, consequences of evolution um, that affect that can affect our health. All right, last example we have silver foxes. These were developed in the Soviet Union and started in 1959, where they were going to take foxes and try and domesticate them just like you would a dog. Um, um, dogs have been domesticated over thousands of years, but they wanted to try to do this in you know a shorter time period. Um, and what they found was when they when they selected for traits that you know that made the foxes more friendly and more domesticated um, and more dependent on humans they also had similar traits that went with it so the ears became floppy the um, um, tail rather than standing up on end went down and became shorter um, their uh, fur became curly these aren't traits that they were selecting for, but um, showed a similar pattern to domesticated dogs. Um, and showed again that you can select for certain traits um, and make changes in populations. Uh, what's interesting is you can get one for only $7,000. So I think if you guys are looking for a Christmas present or a um, you know some sort of appreciation, present for me I'll take a silver fox all right that's all for evolution we'll we'll spend a couple lectures going over this in class <laughs>